Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Well, many thanks for joining us on the Journal of Biophilic Design today. Um, I do hope you subscribe either on your RSS feed um, or on the website, journalofbiophilicdesign.com. It's a free newsletter, so please come and join us over there or on YouTube. And we're really excited today to be joined by Nicole Cronin. Um, she's founder of Rooted in Nature. There'll be a link on the podcast bill that goes with this podcast. So, and what she does, she supports human well-being through our connection to nature using biophilic design to truly make beautiful spaces that feel good and are also good for us too. And the planet, <laughs> I have to say. Um, her philosophy is, and I'm going to quote this because I think this is really, really lovely and it kind of um, is her essence, I think. I truly believe that we can make the world a better place through design. As design professionals, she says, we create the spaces that people spend nearly all of their time in or near. It is our responsibility, this is our responsibility as designers, to create spaces that are good for people, healthy for people, and hopefully with a twist of beauty. And for me, I think that sums up Nicole. So um, Nicole, many thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Lovely. And um, well, before we kind of um, go on about biophilic design and the built environment, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and um, and also what inspired your your nature journey, please? Sure. Um, so, yep, I'm Nicole. <laughs> I, um, I, I like to start by kind of my qualities that are not job related. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm a lifelong learner, connector, nature lover, traveler. Um, love photography. I'm a daughter, a sister, a wife, and a mom to a beautiful four-year-old. Um, and she's honestly been a lot of my inspiration and kind of the path that I'm taking. So um, for some of my history and kind of how I got here, it's a little bit of a, a windy path, as I'm sure many people who get to biophilic design are on. Um, so as a, as a very young adult, I I say very young adult, undergrad. <laughs> so I was, you know, 18 or something. Um, I was really struggling to find my place. I couldn't figure out. I had all this passion and all this love of learning and it, um, I couldn't figure out how, how to organize that into something that might look like a career. So I ended up in three different undergraduate programs at four different schools. <laughs> I talked around a lot. Um, it all totally makes sense now. Architecture, anthropology, and then interior design. So I had this thread, uh, you know, the interconnectivity of these spaces and, and the people in them all along. I spent my childhood playing in the woods with my dog and summers camping across the United States with my family. Um, I live in Wisconsin in the north, um, on, right on Lake Michigan, well not, I'm like five miles away from Lake Michigan. Um, and just feel a deep connection to nature. We still, my husband and I, and hopefully soon my daughter, um, do backpacking and hiking and camping. So I've kind of, you know, always been connected. In my last year of my undergraduate work though, I took a winter break to, um, I was able to go on a program that went to India. And when I returned, it had kind of shifted my whole way that I was looking at design um, from, just the viewpoint of the education that I was having in the United States. And then after that, I took some time to travel around Europe for a few months after I graduated. Um, and that's kind of where my interest in photography grew. And I, I don't know, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I started photographing things that had some sort of qualities of space that I didn't yet understand. I, I kind of looking back noticed that, but um, I really became enamored with expressions of culture that were not my own and try to more deeply understand. And I found that I began seeing connections between my love of travel, the outdoors and mindfulness and photography. They were starting to kind of come together. So then when I returned from Europe, I sort of fell into work that was offered to me. Um, I started designing, I was in retail design and then I designed McDonald's, which sounds nothing like the things I was just talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> However, I, I learned a tremendous amount in those jobs and uh, they really opened the world of psychology in design to me. Mm -hmm. um, retail psychology and then in 
it's called quick serve restaurants in the industry, not fast food, but kind of the psychology, these two very different yet similar psychologies of design. Um, I just, I had no idea it was a field of study. So eventually I, I kept being so interested in the why that I started looking, how do I learn more? Like, how do I, how do I really explore this? Um, not knowing what to do, I became a yoga teacher, hoping I'd find some answers there. Um, that eventually slowly trickled me to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, which is about an hour away from me here in 2013. And I joined their design studies program at the School of Human Ecology, which I love that it's the School of Human Ecology, mm -hmm. for one. Um, just the approach was very unique. And I focused specifically on environment and behavior and sort of created my own path on my master's of fine arts degree around biophilic design. So they don't have a program on it. I kind of just, I came across biophilic design and immediately I knew that's what I wanted to study. And so I kind of made this program. Um, during that time, I got my well AP, so for the well building standard, and um, also resonated with me, you know, around human health. Yeah. And as I was putting together my thesis, I was looking at my photography and started going, oh my gosh, the photos that I had been taking while I was traveling and the photos that I was taking in the natural world, they had similar qualities to them. And it started... I started to understand that it aligned with everything I was reading about biophilic design. Mm -hmm. And that's really became so impactful for me that it wasn't that I was going out and seeking these things that I was reading about. I had already found them. Mm -hmm. And I already knew this. And I was exploring the why. Why was I drawn to these things? Why was I feeling this in spaces? Um, and so it, it kind of felt like a more interconnected path. So my website that you mentioned, uh, that was really my thesis project. I keep it open and free and available. It's just super educational. Um, I I really feel like it's important to share this information with as many people as possible as through you having a podcast about it. Um, so then after that, I, I spent a couple of years um, consulting on biophilic design. Then I had my, and I, I taught a course on environment and behavior at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, then I had my daughter, I took a little time off and um, ended up when I decided to go back to work, working in healthcare. So I'm currently also working in healthcare and then have the consulting business as well. So now I'm, I got to look at it from a retail perspective, a healthcare perspective, a restaurant perspective. It's been mm -hmm. a fun ride. It's, it's really interesting, obviously, because you, if you studied anthropology as well, and you've got the psychology side of things, and you've got the aesthetic mind and feeling of the beauty of nature from the photography point of view and wanting to document something. So I can see where all these threads are kind of like leading and joining up. Um, I mean, why, in your opinion, um, is it important that we bring nature into our built environment? Yeah, so I have I have this quote on my website, and I... Um... And I spent a lot of time thinking about why this work is important. And it's, um, I, I use this E.O. Wilson quote. I don't know if else has quoted this on the podcast, but this is my favorite. Um, I have never found a better sentence that it, I feel like describes this. The crucial first step to survival in all organisms is habitat selection. If you get to the right place, everything else is likely to be easier. Right? So it's, I, I, there's a whole lot of the world that I cannot impact. My small lens is through the built environment and there is an impact that we can have. Um, we can make decisions. We're, we're constantly impacting the people around us, one, whether we're aware of it or not through design. Um, the more awareness we can bring to it, the better job we can do of making those spaces really good for people. Um, so I just, yeah, that quote that's like, yeah. 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 So, and I think about biophilic design also, it's, you know, it's part intuition, it's part research. Mm -hmm. None of this is something, you know, these are not concepts that are new to humans. We're just sort of rediscovering them, I feel like. And um, we, as humans, we were inspired by the nature around us. We built um, using that inspiration and we just knew how to build by being intimately connected to the world around us. And I think we've all been, I would venture to guess all of us have been in spaces that we feel very deeply connected to. 
and not necessarily because of the event taking place there or the people were with, but we feel physically connected to the spaces that we're in. And it's it's this special connection that how do we how do we find that connection, understand what that connection is and replicate it or replicate it or create it for a different group of people that might be different than ourselves. And um, yeah, I just, I feel so strongly that we can create spaces that do that for people, for all people yeah. and can support the human system, like our physical body, as well as our emotional body. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a long time meditator and that plays into a lot of what kind of these special qualities or feelings in space maybe. Um, I, th I think it's really interesting, the research, and it's, it's related to your question, <laughs> the, the research on mindfulness and on biophilic design and how they're both yeah. increasing, um, mindfulness has been around or meditation in some form for what, 2,500 plus years. And, you know, the people who practice mindfulness didn't need research to tell you what it did, yeah. but now we have research to support it. And in some of us who are more academically inclined or want to believe based on that research now we have proof that this kind of esoteric thing actually does something and i kind of feel like that's biophilic design right we have proof now that these deep connections that we had to space around us do actually do something it's a we can verify that that happens you know um and so i, I see biophilia is connecting us with where we came from and who we are as a species mm -hmm. and um, determining the habits that best support us. So I, I love using this example too. Um, so the, this area of expertise, you know, focuses on how humans have adapted to our natural world, the biophilic design, how we're still adapted. Um, but humans are just, we are, the most fantastic mammals at pretending like things don't matter that actually <laughs> matter, right? Um, so we can pretend like we don't actually need the sun and that that doesn't impact us with our circadian rhythm, but it does. And just because we can pretend it doesn't mean it's not gonna have negative effects on our body. So I like to use this example. Um, and I apologize, I can't remember who, it might've been Janine Benyus who first, who I read this from, but it, it was a conversation about zoo design mm -hmm. and how you know, when zoos were first created um, and maybe unfortunately still, the animals would go in basically concrete boxes mm -hmm. and they, they could have the animals live. They could, um, they would maybe eat, but they could have trouble um, reproducing. They would become depressed. Um, you know, walking in circles and they just weren't exhibiting the type of behaviors they would have in a natural environment. So ultimately, I think the conversation is that zoos could keep animals alive, but they couldn't make them flourish. Yeah. And that's how I draw this very strong connection to biophilic design and people and um, our nature connection. We can exist in these spaces, but we can't flourish in spaces that don't support us. And I think it's pretty evident in my opinion that there's a lot of not flourishing going on and we could use some support there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a lovely way of phrasing it actually, yeah, to flourish. Um, they say we can create these boxes, we can create these spaces, but and and it's fine. We can we can be sustained and we can be kept alive, and we can just get on with our you know like in the workplace even. Um, I mean Nigel um, Oslin talks about that. You know the sort of the workplace zoo, how we've created these boxes for people to be in and to to do the everyday things. But actually, are they flourishing? Are they doing the best work they can ever, they can do? Are we living in in our in homes that are boxes and the, and we're living the best life we can our healthcare same thing you know we're just keeping people alive but can we make them flourish can we make them heal you know can we heal them quicker um you know it's funny that you say that about the um what did you call it the office the workplace zoo workplace zoo yeah yeah that's um, 
not just I honestly think that's part of what inspired me to do this work is I worked in one of those yeah yeah. um it was a gray cubicle land with I mean I kid you not everything was gray it was a group of architects and designers but it was just gray cubicles and gray laminate and yeah, gray carpet with and with fluorescent that? lights and no windows. And, yeah. and I thought the same thing, like we are just because we're designers, not that that's such a part, but like we're typically very visual people. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we draw inspiration from the world around us in different kind of unique ways. And, um, and you just put us in the least inspirational environment <laughs> you could ever imagine working in. And, you know, everybody deserves better than that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that, that was a deep inspiration for my work. <laughs> it's great cube of the land. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I worked in one of those as well, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> another story. Um, yeah. I mean, how can we encourage people to really feel um, the difference that it makes, um, you know, as designers, as architects, as interior designers, people that have got the clout to all the, the wherewithal, all the, all the, or they've got the position or the opportunity to create better spaces for us to flourish in um, where we can can use nature um, I mean I know you take for instance people on forest walks um, which I think is a lovely idea so they can actually feel that and hopefully we'll take that back with them to their architectural practice um, to make to make you know to, so that it inspires them um, I mean you you spoke when we when we, we chatted before we recorded the podcast a few weeks ago you said um, you talk about nature as muse I think it's such a lovely thing. Um, I mean, can you explain what that means as well? So yeah, if you can talk about how we can do, how we can connect to nature um, and keep that inspiration in our in our practice, really. Yeah, um, I love this question so much. So <laughs> I I've been doing the biofilic design work really probably since I started my graduate degree in 2013, and <clears throat> this is like the new ish undertaking that I'm just totally inspired by. Uh So I mentioned that I spent time consulting and part of that work was providing continuing education, just kind of the back history of how I got to this. I always love the history of how people get to where they are. So that's what I'm telling (laughs) my story. Um, So I was giving these continuing education courses, a lot of them. I had probably given about 50 in in two years. So, I mean, I was speaking on the topic a lot. always to architects and designers. That was kind of the world that I was in. Uh, However, they were always in, you know, your typical conference room. So even if they were a beautiful space and maybe they had windows, but most likely they didn't, um, there's no direct nature connection in terms of like a patio or an open space or something. And um, honestly, a lot of the time I'd be talking and I could, there would always be a handful of people that were really inspired and thinking about what they wanted to do in their work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Yep. So people inspired and wanting to do the work. And then you could also see there was a group of people who was like, yeah, 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 plants, we get it. We do this. Yeah. We're, we're already on top of it. And, um, and so I kept having this kind of nagging feeling that if I could just get you outside, I bet I could convince you. Like if I could just take you outside on a walk, in nature, to see the world the way that I see the world, kind of through that mindfulness perspective, um, that you would understand why what you are saying and what I'm saying are different. Mm -hmm. So I had an opportunity um, to run like a half day workshop in Anchorage, Alaska, which I had never been to. It had been on my bucket list to get to Alaska. So of course I said yes. Mm -hmm. And when I was looking at the information about the site we were going to be on, I realized it was on not a true nature preserve, but like a, it's a conference center that had a nature area. We'll call it outside, very um, natural, like complete with moose crossings and the whole like Alaskan experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I asked if I could get a continuing education credit that took people outside, could I do that? And they were like all on board. So I ended up getting through IDCEC, which is the interior design group in, in um, the United States and AIA, the architecture group. I don't know if they're just the United States, honestly, but I was able to get it accredited through them. And so I did kind of a educational piece and then we went on a nature walk and then kind of broke down and more educational. Um, and I, it felt 
so impactful to take people outside and do that sensory experience. Um, so I, my favorite, I guess what inspired me to continue on this path was one woman, a principal at an architecture firm. <clears throat> I kind of did a little sharing session at the end using some of the mindfulness techniques that I've kind of picked up along the way. Um, and so she shared with the group that when I first said we were going to go on this nature walk, she was super irritated. It's like, I'm earning a credit. You're just going to make me walk around outside. I have so many emails. I have, you know, like the pressure yeah. of, of having a, a position like that. Right. Um, and I would assume most of us feel pressure like that to not care for ourselves yeah. because there's so much else to do. And so she said, she, she at first was really irritated. Um, but after the reflection time, she said, I realized how much I moved through this world and I never paused to see the beauty that surrounded me. Mm -hmm. And she was so inspired. I had little like handout cards for people to take home that she said she was going to go take her grandkids mm -hmm. on a walk to do this because she wanted them to view the world that way. Oh, how and nice. that, that was like, I'm getting goosebumps thinking yeah, about it because yeah. I, it was one of those experiences. It was like, all right, so how do I do this? How do I do more of this? Um, so I've, I had led a, a couple more workshops where I got people outside in nature. And then I discovered that there was actually a group of people that does this <laughs> called forest therapy guides. And um, I mean, I knew loosely about forest bathing because of the work with biophilic design and I'd come across it. Um, so right now I'm in the middle of training to be a forest therapy guide through the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy in the United States. And I believe um, they're definitely in Europe and South America, and I'm not sure exactly where else they, they are. I think it's taking people outside and sort of, um, I'm gonna draw a, a parallel to healthy eating because sometimes people can connect in that way. So if you ate, well, we call here the standard American diet, but you know that doesn't work for people elsewhere, but kind of the unhealthy fast food, um, less nutrient dense, mm -hmm. say food. Um, maybe you don't take care of your sleep. You don't do some of that stuff. And then you start, you clean up your diet, you get rid of some of the toxins in your environment. Um, you start getting better sleep. You're lowering your sugar intake, some of that stuff. And suddenly you feel great. You have more energy. You sleep better. And you kind of didn't know how good you could feel until you felt that good. Yeah. And I kind of feel like that's at the heart of biophilic design and this forest therapy. Mm -hmm. You don't know that there's a different way to be until you feel it. And then you never want to go back. Yeah. And I kind of feel like that's, that's what I'm trying to offer to architects and designers is to say, let me show you what it could be like. Mm -hmm. Let me take you out and fully explore your senses, mm -hmm. see the beauty in the world around you, watch how subtle the shifts are, watch what our senses get exposed to, and then walk into the building and look at what's missing. Because now you have your closed windows, you have you know your even air temperature, you have mm -hmm. maybe no access to daylight, just all of that stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's um. I just think it's really impactful to get outside and, yeah. you know, if, if you don't have a love for something, mm -hmm. like a true deep love, then how do you work hard to keep it safe? How do you work hard to bring that to the environment around you? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and separately, my hope is that it's also helps to encourage kind of environmental stewardship, mm -hmm. you know, by more deeply, more deeply loving our planet Maybe you care a little bit more about the waste that construction brings to the environment. Maybe you care a little more about some of those other things too. So it's yeah, multiple yeah. levels. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's lovely when you when you told me about what you do um, again before we before we recorded um, a few weeks ago, and I just thought what a lovely idea to inspire people. You know, to actually take people into that environment and go you know, look, this is, this is really, this, how do you feel here? Kind of get them to connect themselves. And then when you say you go back to the built environment, you go back to a building and you're like, you, you know, yeah, what is missing? How can we reconnect that? How can we conjure that, that feeling that's outside that that's inside? Um, 
I mean, why do you think, I mean, obviously biophilic design, there's obviously many reasons why we need biophilic design in the built environment, but why is it important, do, do you think, that we need to ensure that um, everybody who's involved in um, making decisions about design of a space, you know, whether that's a building, a home or a town or a city, um, actually understands the importance and benefits um, of, of bringing biophilic design into that space? Yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> Again, I think it's just so powerful that um, sometimes it's hard for me to summarize my thoughts. So <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do, I really think it's important that everybody understands the impacts of design and our health and well being. But, you know, biophilic design being a piece of that, but design in general. Yeah. Um, and I, I also think biophilic design um, or design for health and well being can be a great tool for equity. Yeah. Um, so in environment behavior studies, we were taught and what I've done taught students is to really engage and watch our environments. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of the thing that anthropological um, ethnography, like you're there, you're watching, but you're not supposed to be involved in it. You're just supposed to kind of be examining what's around you and um, deeply watch the space and watch the people and see what's actually happening and try not to put our own judgment or lens on that, um, which is very challenging. You know, it's a constant work in progress to be able to come to something like that. Um, and so if we don't have all of the appropriate stakeholders who play a role in not just the, you know, we talk about the integrative approach in design, you want all the players there. Sometimes the players are the subcontractors, the electrician, the you know general contractor, the architect, but it's and maybe you have an owner swap or two, mm -hmm. but who else does this space impact? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think in a, <clears throat> I've sat in planning meetings and watched kind of the what I would call biophilic niceties, you know, get value engineered out. They're mm -hmm. not valued as important. And um, what about if we if there's the people, planet, profit, right? Mm -hmm. The sustainable model. Yeah. What if the the people, we, we definitely know there's profit. They're always a stakeholder that's there. Yeah. Um, maybe planet is there. Maybe if you're in some sustainable building, you know, lead or bream or, you know, mm -hmm. some other sustainable living building model. Um, what about if there was a people, mm -hmm. people person, <laughs> people stakeholder there? Um, somebody who was, their priority was making sure that human health and well-being was a primary focus, was not value engineered out. It was not a nicety that it was actually held at the importance that it is alongside other sustainable things that you're doing for the planet. Um, you know, could you also bring in a, a community advocate, somebody in the community that says what the community needs mm -hmm. might not be that development to gentrify that neighborhood. Um, maybe you can work alongside them. What about an indigenous representative? somebody who speaks to the land that you're building on mm -hmm. um you know are those stakeholders are those valid names to sit at the table you know if you're not at the table you don't have a voice yeah and be at the table we and, and the owners or architects need to do our role in bringing those voices to the table to make sure they're heard mm -hmm. um and so i you know, it's like if in, let's say you're doing a sustainable building, if you don't bring, if you don't know from day one that you value these different, you know, credits that you need to get and say a year into planning, you go backtrack and try to fix it. You're just skyrocketing your cost and the time that you're spending on the project. Same with human health. If you design with it from day one using biophilic principles, um, it stays, the whole design is created around that. You can't just stick a bunch of people in the core of the building and call it a day, right? Because it's a priority. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I think it's really important that we make sure, you know, there's, there's a, um, 
I guess that was actually your next question. How do we do yeah. that? I'm just kind of going into it. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I was, just, I was going to say, actually, yeah, I mean, you kind of, you sort of yeah. touched on, um, you touched on uh, kind of how we do that, how we, you know, how we start to do that by bringing in stakeholders. And I think what you said there about, um, you know, bringing in like a community representative, bringing in indigenous peoples or just bringing in the people. I mean, you think about it, we're all, if you're an architect or you're a designer, you're creating the space what for you know it's not just to sit there empty it's actually going to have users in it it's going to have people it's going to have bodies it's going to have patients or 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 or, or students or or um workforce or or families going to be working living and, and sleeping in these places so it, it's, it's mad isn't it not to have a human-centric um design right. mindset and actually like you said i mean that's just like why you say we've got the well-being standard we've got all these kind of things so why haven't we got a people standard a kind of <laughs> really yeah right, like well you know it's well is the people i mean it's the people standard yeah. but even if you don't do well like building mm. model you could still have a people representative you know you could still have a person with you know even if it's the hr team <laughs> you know it's <laughs> I mean, maybe hopefully you'd have somebody who focuses on building also, but you know, yeah. um, that's yeah. a start. And yeah, yeah it's um, um, right when these buildings shut down at 5 p.m. Mm. or 1700, <laughs> I had to do <laughs> math for a second. Um, you know, when the building shut down, what happens in that neighborhood? Does it stay dynamic? You know, is it still, is it still human centered mm -hmm. or is it just shut down? Mm. That's, that's not how nature would react. You know, it's not like at five o'clock, nature <laughs> just stops, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, mm. So yeah, that nature is a muse, nature is a model. If you, you know, if you watch nature, then you see how kind of, uh, you know, we're designed to be in that environment. How are we not designing for that? You know, yeah. that kind of natural. Yeah. Um, so I think like in bringing the right people to the table, <clears throat> Sometimes it's an owner's rep and an architect. And then after a lot of that's already developed, you have maybe the landscape architect comes in at that point or the interior designer comes in at that point. But all the big decisions have been made. You know, the, the way that the building sits on the land, the views that they're going to ultimately be able to have, like, that stuff is all decided without those specific key experts. And um, I'm, I'm also... In my graduate work, I had two landscape architects on my thesis committee, as well as an architect and an interior designer. Um, and I started to see just this incredible value in interior designers working directly with landscape architects. Mm -hmm. um, and like the, just because we work in silos mm -hmm. of, I'm an interior designer and I do X and I'm an architect and I do X and I'm a landscape architect and I do X. That's not how somebody experiences that space. True. So we have to be able to communicate. What is that view to the interiors as you're entering the, you know, the plot of land mm -hmm. and you're, you see the big building, but then that interior as you get closer, you know, it's kind of those thresholds of, of change in space. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you create the most impactful view around biofield design? Um, from an interior space, working with the landscape architect, you know, it's kind of those working both ways. So I'm going to say, I think what you're saying there really is, is like to bring these key, these people with the expertise f in order to create spaces that are better for, for people, planet and, and the place and the environment and everything else um, to bring them into the, 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 the conversation earlier at the beginning, really, it's, it's essential. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did a so I did a workshop last summer um, with this really cool little co-op, um, a co-op pharmacy, mm -hmm. and just a very unique group. So they were they were relocating, and they were relocating from more of the city center to a little more. Um, they were going to have a little land mm -hmm. this at this next move. So the design was already kind of done when he came across me, and I I did the workshop, but. We did some of the forest bathing walk at their new site, and um, it was it was really working to gather. Like a, we went on the walk, 
I gave them some time to kind of process and we gathered after the walk. And then I asked a series of questions, kind of a design thinking ish model. We didn't really have time to do the full everything, but um, to observe how what they saw in the space might apply to their business or their business model. Um, so anything from the design of the space, but also the interaction with their team. So they had the team members and the managers, they kind of had everybody, the pharmacists, everybody was there. Um, but also how this could impact their customers, their outreach to the community. And we brainstormed and then created themes around what they had taken from that walk. Okay. And, and so some of the themes that bubbled up were the community became very important in how they were going to kind of see this. They saw this kind of interweb, interconnected web mm -hmm. and how they were going to outreach to the community um, comfort for both their customers and also the staff, um, customer engagement, um, the direct visual connection with nature. So small things with the layout that they could still impact mm -hmm. to allow people for a better view. Um, restoration and art and beauty. So they really wanted to have like a um, local artist yeah. kind of, you know, connection to the community um, and sustainability. And they were already working on that with the architect. But so when I say nature is muse, that's what I mean. Like they used this walk in nature as a muse for a whole bunch of future potential business ideas. Mm -hmm. And it was just delight. It was just delightful to do. Absolutely lovely. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned it's a it's a pharmacy, and I know you've done got a lot of experience working in healthcare, um, you know, and sort of different and providers and things. Um, and why do you think? I mean, in a nutshell, <laughs> I mean, why do you think it's important to bring biophilic design into into the healthcare situation? I've got. It's the only time you're ever going to hear me say I have one word <laughs> for this: stress. Sorry. Stress. It's stress. Um, mm. Like stress on so many levels. If you are a patient at a hospital or visiting a loved one at a hospital, you are under most likely a lot of stress. Even if it's something good, like maybe the birth of a child, you're still like, you're going to bring home a new baby and that's terribly stressful. <laughs> um, joy, but like also very overwhelming and stressful. Um, you know, it's, People are just, people are just so stressed. I feel like I could just end, <laughs> I could end it at that just generally. Um, but you know, when you're a patient, you need places to decompress, yeah. to be able to feel deeply, to have those emotions, um, maybe to have a private conversation with, you know, a physician, a loved one, you know, maybe very hard conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I'm, I would bet, if your listeners have been listening to the podcast for a while, they will have heard all the statistics about health benefits with connection, connecting to nature. Um, you know, things like that patients with views of trees and quality access to day to daylight, leave the hospital faster, experience less stress and pain and take less pain medication. Those are some, you know, some of the typical research um, examples that get brought up around biofield design. But how could we make that even more painful or painful? <laughs> how could we make that more powerful? <laughs> Not painful. Um, it, what if patients had um, biodiverse outdoor spaces on each floor or unit that they could walk out onto? Imagine. Um, mm. What if the staff could go with them? Mm. Yeah. Um, what if there were high quality accessible parks on the hospital property mm. or directly adjacent? Um, that maybe a patient who was in pretty good condition could walk on by their cell or with a staff member, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's more opportunities in everything from wayfinding. And I, I look at a lot of these from a biophilic lens and mm -hmm. how we navigate space and how we decrease stress. Um, having... Um, I can't think of the term that I wanted to use, but yeah, there's just, there's a lot of impact that we can have on the people in spaces, but it's really about stress and doing, I can't change your outcome necessarily mm -hmm. or change the, um, the diagnosis you might get, mm -hmm. 
or whatever that hardship is, the financial hardship that might come from that. Mm -hmm. um, but if I can at least make your experience there be a benefit to you, then I'm doing good. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the least we should be able to do yeah. as designers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I just, your, your description of that, can you imagine that if there was like a, you know, on every level, there was like a, a terrace or something with views out there, or even with, you know, plant pots or trees or, or plot, you know, or, or just views of nature, even if it's like made up views of nature or just something that we can just, like you say, decompress you know reduce our cortisol levels which you've, you've you've touched you know you've touched on the fact that and the people listening to this podcast will know there's all this research that's been done that our connection to nature and particularly by flick design when it's in the built environment when it's in interior spaces how our cortisol levels drop which means our blood pressure drops which means we get you know we, with that fight fight and flight um pressure on our system um is reduced so it actually right. brings us down and if you can somehow combine that like with this sort of mindfulness sort of uh, mindset as well um I think that's really great I mean we sort of we talk about the health of patients and I know you've looked at how the buildings um impact healthcare workers and staff as well so not just the patients but staff um I mean can you maybe set the scene a little bit about how you know the sort of what type of day-to-day -day stress that biophilic design can relieve maybe um you know and how it can support that yeah so start by saying I'm not a healthcare worker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I can't speak from personal experience. This is um, the experience that I can speak from is as somebody who works on a daily basis with the caregivers, um, with people who are in that direct access, um, yeah. with people who are under just a normal stress. Yeah. Um, and I have family that works as nurses in hospitals, and I watch the stress that they're through and how it impacts their personal lives. Yeah. Um, and they're working in incredibly difficult situations. And, you know, on top of the normal stressors, COVID has just hit hard. Mm -hmm. And there are staffing shortages all over the place, which just increases the stress. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of turnover as people are trying to find new balance. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, there's a lot of stress. I mean, it's just really, um, a lot of fear and a lot of stress mm -hmm. that people are dealing with. And, um, you know, same as I don't really think the design for the patients and the staff should be necessarily thought of as different. Mm -hmm. They all need the same things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and not just the care staff, because I've technically work in like a support role, I'm not a staff, but there's um, the environmental services team that does all the cleaning and they're, they are making the hospitals clean for us, worrying about infection, um, going into OR rooms after a loss. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's, they're under incredible stress as well, mm -hmm. um, and very emotional sometimes. Um, work that they're doing, the facilities, the maintenance, you know, the hospitals would not run if we didn't have those teams available. Um, administration, customer service, that's like taking the stress of the person who's getting to the hospital. You know, there's there's a lot of people, not just the caregivers, but everybody who works or visits an environment like that should have access to ways to decompress. Um, like hospitals are, they're heavy places. If you're somebody kind of say emotionally attuned, um, that I don't mean they're physically heavy, although they're also that, yeah, but I mean, you know, they're emotionally heavy yeah, places yeah. to be in. Mm -hmm. um, this is a place where the entire life cycle is experienced. Yeah. There's not many other places that we can say that for, you know, the, the staff experience, a lot of this right alongside the patients yeah. and some that they get to know very, very well. I've watched when teams lose a patient mm -hmm. and, um, you know, have to turn around and walk into another room. Yeah you know, how can we help that? So I know there's, um, you know, it could go into a lot of the statistics or, you know, some of that breakdown, but I'm trying to come at it a little bit from that emotional level is it's not just applying a statistic yeah. or a square footage of plants or something. It's how do we address that? How do we, how do we help, um, like prospect and refuge spaces, I think are incredibly powerful and underutilized. You know, 
ability to just step away for a minute, mm -hmm. like let the emotion come out, mm -hmm. don't bottle it up. Um, some ways that we could, you know, if, if that staff can now walk on that terrace with the patient, they also get that. Yes. They also get that momentary break. They mm -hmm. get that fresh air. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of funny because as I say this, immediately I think of all the like reasons this cannot be done in healthcare and, and all the, you know, arguing that might come back about how it's not possible, but, see, but it could be, I, it could be possible to design spaces like this, yeah. if that were our top priority. Yeah, exactly. And it should be, it should be, yeah. because it, ultimately, whoever we are, all the decision makers, you know, the people with the purse strings, the people with the design tick off boxes, they're going to end up there. You know, they, as you said, they started life there. They're going to they're going to be there at some stage in their life. You know, whether it's in a private healthcare situation or or not. But you know, you know, just a bit of forethought, really. So, so the, you know, even from a selfish point of view, the person that's like signing this off should be thinking about that. Um, I mean, you mentioned. I mean, I think it's lovely to hear, and it's it's important that more people hear the emotional side of this because yeah we can talk about like you said the square footage of how many plants we need and and how much air voc reduction and all this sort of stuff that we need but you mentioned and it's so true you know these these people they go from one room you know they might lose someone that they've got connected to because you do they're in you know even if they're only in there for a week or sometimes people are in there long term and then they lose them and then they have to go straight into another room they have to go and do something else or they have to go and manage something or whatever and just taking that moment you know something or creating a space where they can decompress i think is really really important um i mean i'm personally working with with the journal by design these virtual nature wars we're working with nook, nook pods which are creating these like movable mm -hmm um time out places for the nhs workers over here in the in england so they're yeah. like movable uh, sound booths if you want and they can just sit in them there's a view of nature it's a printed view of nature um but they can just decompress for a short time and they can move them around so it's fantastic obviously there's a cost involved in those but you know you can reuse them you can move them around so actually they're, they're, there's ways of retrofitting things like that into spaces until we can get to the point where we can build yeah. new spaces or we're we're renovating a space and we can incorporate these by default we need it i mean there's more and more understanding of well-being and mindfulness and stress and ptsd on on all different levels not just because they've been in the army it's you know there's ptsd in um in in healthcare as well um but you mentioned as well the prospects and refuge. I think that's I, I I'm I'm with you on that one because I talk about that a lot, and I I think that's really important to feel um, held by a space that you can still be you can have a view out on, you know. And I think in those, I love that being held by a space. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, if if you are in a space where in healthcare particularly, is, there's a lots of bodies, there's a lots of people, there's a lot of noise. Um, I mean, I've set the journal up and because I wanted to share, like we spoke about at the beginning, but I wanted to share the knowledge because both my parents were in a healthcare environment and, you know, there was there was a negative environment, as, environmental aspects in each of those, creating stress on both of them. And, um, you know, and one of the big ones is cacophony. It's the noise levels. I mean, it's phenomenal. Some of these like accident and emergency is, is ridiculously noisy. In particular, I mean, I don't know what it, what it must be like, I suppose, in different city places, but where my mother was for instance it was incredibly noisy and it was like two o'clock in the morning when we got in there and and you know we we're still there for like 24 hours plus in accident emergency and there's people in the corridors and just ridiculous and people were shouting over things and there was all different languages sort of spoken you think no wonder people can't understand or there's misdiagnosis and and you mentioned stress you know i mean that fundamentally is you know, if, if the soundproofing, obviously one of the things about bifolic design is about improving acoustics, improving that level of it. As you say, it's not just about plants, it's about creating that, replicating nature. Um, and I did that podcast with Andrea Harmon and she said, you know, nature doesn't have walls. So if we can create a space that sort of, you know, improves the acoustics so that we don't feel like everything's reverberating on our eardrums and, and um, you know, because we know the psychoacoustics as well, that it increases our our levels um anyway i think i think we, <laughs> it's, it's lovely to have you here and nicole really really appreciate it um I mean, i'm going to ask you my final question um but is there any, before we go is there anything else that you would like to add yeah that that we can build environments that 
either positively or negatively affect, I mean, everything from fertility to sleep to time needed for injuries to heal mm -hmm. to immune function, cardiovascular disease, mental health. I mean, all, all of this stuff. And um, biophilic design can help with a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, stress, stress is considered the most important health risk for employees globally. Mm -hmm. That is um, pretty crazy. And um, when, when I run these exercises that connect you to nature, either physically or through a visual exercise, um, it can be really emotional. I get in a 20 minute visual exercise, people will start crying. It's, we are very emotionally connected to our species, even if we're not aware of it. Um, and designers, we can impact the whole human through design. So I guess I'd kind of leave this with, for the listeners who are actively involved in the design of a building, take a moment to think about how many people your job impacts. It truly impacts today, tomorrow, and 20 years. We have an incredibly huge impact on the people we design spaces for. So what does this kind of expansive view of our profession mean? The concepts really are um, something I've come to believe is that this is in line with ideas on preventative health care. And, you know, is a, is a design model we could think of ourselves as preventative healthcare professionals or as healers and that we really have this kind of impact that we can make. So that's the last piece. <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely. I think that's really nice. Um, yeah, to think of yourself as, as healers. I think that's a, that's a different, com completely different mindset shift. Um, so really, I suppose in the final question is this, is the magic question um, really. And if you could, paint the world with a magic brush of biophilia, what would it look like? This is one I was thinking about a lot. And I, I'm sure some people have really profound things that they say. <laughs> I, what honestly keeps surfacing for me is that it can be a tool for equity. And if I could paint the world through a biophilic lens, it would be that the native lands that we, um, we, I speak in the term of those of us who came from colonized areas or were part of colonization, that we can get back in touch with that nature and restore it and allow that equal access to everybody. Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.